Uh, with copper oxide gains production, uh, there are also two basic methods, the traditional method involving nanocoated copper plate and a, a pure copper plate in a salt solution. And then there is the graphite rod case where it's just a graphite rod and a copper plate in a salt solution. Uh, this is one example where the two methods are actually fairly close uh, as far as the, the power supply and the current and, and etc. Mainly because in the traditional method we have two copper plates in a salt solution which means that the electrolytic potential difference between the two is zero. So you don't get that uh, voltage which actually drives the current if you connect a wire between them. Uh, so therefore, even with the traditional method, we use generally a power source for producing copper oxide gains. There is actually a very small potential difference between the two, between the, the nanocoded plate and the normal copper plate, as a result of the nanocoding, which itself uh, produces something like 50 to 100 millivolts, depending on the setup, etc. So if you were to connect a wire between them, you would get a very small current flowing and uh, you, would also, you would produce copper oxide GANs all the time. But that's a slow process, so a power supply will help, help to speed that up. And with the graphite rod, it's pretty much the same kind of idea. You have the, the graphite in the rod itself generates a potential difference between the rod and the copper plate of, a, of about the same magnitude as with the nano coating, which is interesting. So if you were to connect the carbon rod directly to the copper plate with a wire, you would also get a very small current and therefore you could produce copper oxide gains that way, uh, but it's a slow process, so it makes a lot more sense to add a power supply to it. The other thing that's uh, different about copper oxide GANs is that you get different colored uh, GANs depending on things like the current and the amount of oxygen available uh, among other things which I'll talk a bit more about later. So with that uh, we'll have a look at some examples. Okay, here's an example running at 10 milliamps. Uh, I'm using a 100 ohm resistor in the circuit and we have 2.6 volts of the power supply. Uh, if we have a look at the against production, we have the typical arrangement with carbon rod next to a copper plate, a fairly thick one in this case because that allows me to create a lot of copper oxide against before the thing wears out. Uh, we have the bubble going at full speed. Uh, if I zoom in, you can see a nice looking glue copper oxide gans at the bottom. Here is another example uh, running at 50 milliamps. I'm using 10 ohm resistor and 2.5 volts uh, the power supply. If you look at the GANS production, uh, it's a bit difficult to see because the solution is a bit cloudy. Uh, but one thing we can notice definitely is that the color is distinctly more green than the previous 10 milliamp uh, scenario. And this is a general property, as you increase the current, it moves more and more green and other colors eventually, which I'll talk about a bit more later on. In the previous video, I used a 1% uh, salt solution because I find that it produces uh, better quality GANs. To demonstrate this, um, I've included here 
direct comparison between a 1% and a 10% a solution. One on the left is the 1%. Uh, it was produced uh, using 50 milliamps and went for about 10 hours or so. One on the right is exactly the same except that it uh, has 10% salt solution. And uh, it's pretty clear that there is a significant difference between the two. Uh, firstly, in the volume of the cans produced, surprisingly. I think one of the reasons for that is that the 10% solution produces a gas that is more powdery and therefore quite a bit more compact. And we can see this by looking at the 1% one, where if we move around we see that it's a lot more fluffy and uh, moves around in a, a wave type motion. Uh, similar in fact to the CO2 example in the previous video, YouTube video. This suggests to me that the 1% case produces stronger fields that first of all separate the gas particles and uh, also uh, there's some kind of attractive force that keeps the whole unit together much the same as for the uh, CO2 case uh, in the previous YouTube video. So I, I think I think the 10% one produces a more electrolytic type result without the actual field forces or not as much at least. We can see this a bit better by shaking the glass. If we zoom in we should be able to get a better idea of what's going on. And we can see here that the 1% case has uh, quite a bit of body to it and uh, volume which is even larger than, than previously. That will settle down over time to what we had before. Uh, but that's typical of uh, field effects in Ganses. Whereas the one on the right, uh, we, it might be a bit hard to see, but we can see a little bit of uh, structure there in that there are the units moving around, but a lot less than the case on the left. If we fast forward a little bit, uh, we can see that on the right, most of the solid matter has pretty much gone to the bottom, uh, even though we have fine particle cloud still hanging around, which hangs around for a long time. But the important thing is that the solid material has gone to the bottom, which again is typical of the metal oxide materials that don't have the, the field forces affecting them. So I think this demonstrates pretty clearly that a lower salt solutions will produce higher field forces. I suspect this will be true for uh, most metal oxides if not all. It will be interesting to see. Here is uh, a comparison uh, between the different color ganses, or at least some of them at least. Uh, on the left we have the 10 milliamp uh, version that we saw at the beginning that produces a, quite a blue color. Uh, the second one from the left is the 50 milliamp version we just saw. That's, as you can see, that produces a slight green tinge on it. And that's typical of what happens as you increase the current. You start to get more and more of the green until you get to the olive green color you see on the third one from the left, which is uh, around about 100 to 200 milliamp type of area, depending on oxygen availability. The next one is the copper oxide. Uh, it's the black. CU all version. Typically the green are found to be pretty unstable actually and uh, over time and or sometimes actually quite quickly converts to the black version as uh, shown on the right. 
as we increase the current to half an amp or higher, we start to see the orange-brown GANs coming in, which is basically a mixture really of the black and the CU2 or pure red version, uh, which is the end point of the, of the actual process if you increase the current and or decrease the oxygen. Uh, so we get a whole range of colors for copper. And in fact, I've done an experiment some time back where I changed the current within the same uh, run. And you can clearly see the separation of the different colored ganses into layers. I will include a picture of it in the video so you can see the distinct layers happening depending on the current. In order to try and understand why the current uh, would have that sort of an effect, I've drawn a, a representation here of what is shown in the photograph, where you have the three regions, uh, the blue, green and orange. And in fact, there was originally a thin black line between the green and the orange, which, which disappeared by the time the experiment was finished. I've also shown here the oxygen to copper ratio for the different types of copper oxides that we get. Starting with the blue one, which is less than 50 milliamp, we have the, the blue copper oxide ganses, which according to the information uh, that I found online, the blue copper oxide GANS is actually CuOH2, as you see there. So it's actually a copper hydroxide, really, than a copper oxide, but I think they're pretty similar in practice. Next, we have the green region. We start to uh, get more and more green as we move up. This is increasing the current as we go up and decreasing the oxygen to copper ratio. So we have um, the green one is there are two possibilities with the green. There is the CuO2 listed as copper oxide, but I've also found online that the Cu2 or 3 version is also green or can be green. So I'm not sure uh, which one it is actually, probably a combination of both. Given that the oxygen to copper ratio decreases as we move up, uh, I'm inclined to think that it may actually be the CO2 or 3, which has got a uh, oxygen to copper of 1.5 rather than 2. But in any case, we use the blue more than the green. Then we have the CuO, which is the black version we saw. And then we have the orange, which is a combination of uh, the black one and the pure red Cu2 or So I think one explanation why the increasing current gives you the different uh, copper oxide combinations is that increasing the current produces more copper plus uh, ions near the plate. Uh, making more ions available to combine with the oxygen to produce the copper oxides. So therefore, if you keep the oxygen availability constant, one would expect that more copper ions would mean that there is less oxygen to combine with it. So you then start to get the lower O2 copper ratios. Also, the implication of this is that if you reduce the available oxygen, you will get uh, also the same effect happening. You will get the uh, lower oxygen to copper ratio versions coming up. Uh, this is confirmed by the fact that if you uh, reduce the uh, oxygen in the bubbler by, for example, squeezing the rubber, uh, then you will find that this whole transition process happens a lot quicker than uh, at full uh, bubbler capacity. So that all makes very good sense. In theory, the same thing should apply to most of the metal oxides that we encounter. 
like for example with making gold gains we get the gold the dark red and the uh, purple varieties of the gold gains depending on the current uh, and I think a few other ones sort of fit that category as well.